Good morning, everybody. Wow. So exciting to be here. 25 years. It's hard to believe. Uh, it was great to see some of you who were in Vesper Hall that day 25 years ago. What an amazing thing. And so my kudos to you and, uh, of course, to uh, Pastor Mark and Cheryl who have been here the best years of their life almost from the beginning. And of course to Pastor Rick and Becky Johnson who had the vision and gave so much of their lives to have this church what it is today and Bobby and Becky Bonner, the relationship they've had with this church through the year. I better stop right there. I'm going to leave somebody out. But uh, man, we're just so grateful for that. You know, Graceway last week celebrated their 79th birthday. And some of you might remember that I was the third pastor in those 79 years, and Tim Dunn now is number four. So if there's one thing that this family of churches has illustrated, it's consistency, right? Got to stick by the stuff. And so uh, I was not able, Cheryl and I were in Central America the last couple of weeks, and I was in Mexico a couple of weeks before that. And so uh, I didn't get to go to our birthday bash at Graceway, but uh, this was really the only little hole that I had in my schedule for the next several months. And so we are honored. Cheryl's there in the back, but we are so honored to be here on the occasion of this 25th anniversary. I don't get the chance to speak in English a lot anymore, so I'm a little nervous. I mean that sincerely. So if, if I say something kind of silly, please forgive me, have patience with me. But I would like to share with you some thoughts from 1 John chapter 5 this morning, a passage that has always been special to me. You know, usually when you're in seminary, you're going through some theological studies and you take Greek classes, usually your first year of Greek studies, you have to translate 1 John from Greek back into your native language. So it, I've, I've always had an affinity uh, for this book. It's, it's an amazing book, but about a year ago, I guess it was, just, just about a year exactly, I, I was studying 1 John chapter 5. And I saw something I'd never seen before. Not content, uh, read it, taught it many times, but I saw an application that I'd never seen before. It was a very personal application. Because what I saw in 1 John chapter 5 was my own personal story, or at least a good part of it. And I would suspect that there are probably some people here today that this is your story as well. And so what I want to do is I want to, I want to share some thoughts with you about two things. And you're going to, I'm going to tell you what these two things are. And if you've read 1 John chapter 5, you're probably going to think, what? Where did you get that? Hang, hang with me. Two things I want to talk about this morning. Number one is the power of knowing that you belong. And the second thing that I want to talk about this morning is the power of the lies that we tell ourselves. And both of those things came to me in such a, a powerful, uh, kind of a weird, strange, mysterious way, as, as I'll tell you my story as we, we go through here. But I don't know about you, but I, I have always struggled to feel like I belong. And let me tell you a, a little bit about why that is. T and some of you know me for a while. You're, you're, you're going to recognize maybe bits and pieces of my story. But uh, here's, here's my situation. I was the first child, and for 10 years, the only child of my mom and dad. I have one brother who's 10 years younger than I am. By the time he got old enough to play with, I was off to college. Okay? Now, my father was an only child. My mother was an only child. My grandmother on my dad's side had left her husband before my dad was born. He had come back from World War I, shell shock, we would call that today PTSD. Uh, finally got his life together, but it was too late to put the marriage back together. I never met that grandfather. I had a grandma and a grandpa on my mom's side, but uh, here, was, here was the scene with us. Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's, Easter, it was me, my mom, and my dad. I have no aunts, I have no uncles, I have no cousins. 
And can I tell you that I was always envious of large families? Friends, kids at school, you know, get together and have, you know, 30 or 40 people over at the house for Christmas or, or some of the holidays, and I, I, I never knew that. When I was in mid-grade school, we moved in with my grandmother, so there were then four of us. I think our family invented us four no more. The only family at school that could have a family reunion and a Volkswagen Beetle, that was us. And finally, my brother came along, so there were five of us. We were really growing wildly, but uh, he, here, was the other, here was the other thing that I struggled with. I, I come from a family of artists, and I don't mean people who painted as a hobby. My grandmother graduated from the Kansas City Art Institute back in the days when Walt Disney was hanging out there. My dad has a degree in fine arts, a painter and a sculptor, and, and uh, so if you know anything about artists, they're a little different. So I was the weird kid, okay? I just want to confess that. I was the kid that was always reading. I was the loner. I was the one that really didn't have a lot of friends. Uh, I was hanging out down at the library instead of hanging out with the kids and all this type of stuff. And you might say, well, what happened to your artistic genes? They stopped before they got to me, stopped dead in their tracks. There is no way that I could paint or draw anything. My artistic genes came out on the musical side. Now, I grew up in the 60s, okay? Rolling Stones, Beatles. Can I get an amen? All right, thank you. All right. So you might expect that if, if, as I was discovering my musical abilities that I would have learned to play guitar and or drum and formed a band or something. Well, I did learn to play guitar a little bit, but actually what I did is I played French horn in the orchestra to the degree that I got a scholarship to college for that. But what am I, any other weirdos out there? Can you feel my pain a little bit? And, and why it is that I always struggled to feel like I belonged anywhere. Never felt like I belonged at school, never felt like I belonged much of anywhere. Uh, came to Christ in college, met Cheryl, we got married in, in our mid to early 20s. We took off in a Volkswagen hippie van to Central America. And uh, over the course of the years, we've emigrated to three different countries. I'm, I'm looking at a very suburban white group of people this morning, and so probably not a lot of immigrants, but if you've ever immigrated to another country, you know the feeling of not belonging, right? And uh, we have felt that feeling. We've gone through that process those three times, moving to three different countries, and every time struggling to feel like, I don't belong. I can remember our first Sunday in, in Costa Rica many, many years ago, uh, going to a restaurant with my family on a Sunday, not speaking a single word of Spanish at that time, and just pointing to something on the menu and hoping that it was something that wouldn't bite me. And uh, it, it's just uh, uh, what was a struggle to feel like we belong. Now, here's, here's what I'm wanting to tell you. Over the years, I got really good at blending in, okay? I, I really did. Over the course of, of my life, I've been able to work in between 70 and 80 countries on six continents. I can get around in several different languages, but can I tell you something? Blending in is not the same thing as belonging. I used to work a lot in an area in South Africa, a suburb of Johannesburg that used to have a lot of uh, fame back in the days of apartheid when I was there, uh, called Soweto. Uh, I have been the only white dude in that city of two and a half million people. I learned to blend in. I can do that. I've been called a cultural chameleon. But I want you to understand that blending in is not the same thing as belonging. 1984, we moved to Kansas City, which was really our fourth immigration, and by far the hardest of all. We moved back to our birth country, and uh, realized we didn't belong. 
We had two girls who spoke Spanish as their first language, who had never been more than a few weeks in this country. I remember sending our 12, 13-year-old daughter off to junior high school for the first time. She had grown up in a one-room schoolhouse taught by a teacher from New Zealand. She didn't know anything about George Washington, but she can sing all types of New Zealand folk songs and tell you the history of New Zealand. Remember standing with her on the street corner waiting for a bus to take her to a junior high school with 1,300 other kids and just feeling the terror of that for her. And you know the one place in all the places that I've been around the world that I never went back to? I never went back to the place where I was from. My parents moved away about the time I was in college. There was no reason to go back, and especially because I didn't belong. And I'm telling you that this morning. I'm not asking for sympathy. I am offering some empathy for other people like me who have struggled sometimes. Now, maybe you haven't to the degree that I have, but I think everybody knows the feeling of moving to a new neighborhood, going to a new school, starting a new job, moving in different social circles and all that type of stuff and struggling to connect, struggling to belong and, and feeling like, man, what, what, what do I have to do to belong here? And so this morning and here in 1 John chapter 5, after that rather lengthy introduction, I, I, I want to share with you three ways, powerful biblical ways to know that you belong. And then three powerful benefits from that. And then finally, I want to talk to you about the lies that we tell ourselves. First, let me tell you something about John this morning. I, I want you to imagine, we're sitting in a tent, which is kind of nice rather than inside a, a nice, beautiful, newly remodeled auditorium, because I want you to think with me this morning as though you lived in the first century. I want you to imagine that you're sitting in church one day and somebody is reading this letter to you, because for the first 1,500 years of the church of Jesus Christ, nobody walked around with a black Bible under their arm. Most people did not know how to read. And so if you, if you had some scripture, it was because either you were in Europe and you could see the scriptures in stained glass windows, or you were in other places in the world where you sat in church and listened to one of the few people who had a copy of scripture who would read it to you. And so just this morning, pretend like you don't know a lot of things about theology in the Bible. And obviously you do. You're part of a good church. But I want you to see that John was a real life he, he was a man who had friends, he had family, he, he had bad breath until he brushed his teeth in the morning. He, he sometimes struggled with arthritis in his old age, I'm surely. It's been many years now since the resurrection. And John, disciple of Jesus, is now the Apostle John. He is Pastor John. He is pastor of the church in Ephesus. And probably, we can't prove this, but there's really good evidence that he's probably the founder of the seven churches of Asia that Jesus dictated to the same John in the first couple of three chapters of the book of the Revelation. All of those churches in the southwest corner of Turkey. If you've never been there, it's a fascinating place. Sometimes people say, would you, would you like to go to Jerusalem? Been there, done that, take me back to Turkey. There's as much biblical history in Turkey and countries like Iran and Iraq as there are in Jerusalem. Those are the things that sometimes we don't really understand. But I want you to think with me about John, and here's what's happening. John, if he's not founded these seven churches, he certainly has been a part of all seven of them. They are bonded in his heart. He has invested the better part of his life in preaching the gospel and bringing up these seven churches of Asia, but he's sad because division is creeping in. False teaching is creeping in. And the thing that amazes me about John is how he deals with this situation. Now, John is a totally different personality than Paul. Paul was a fighter. Paul would, would kick rears and take license plate numbers, okay? He would name names. That's the way that Paul dealt with things. John doesn't take that approach. John does something absolutely amazing. John says, hey guys, look, I was there with Jesus, okay? 
I heard him with my ears. I saw him with my eyes. I touched him with these hands. He touched me. I put my head on his chest. I was there. And then he says, let's talk about what we have in common. Instead of fighting the false beliefs, instead of fighting the teachers who were going off in this way and that way, John said, let's talk about the things that really matter. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about what Jesus said when he took that entire Old Testament scripture and said, let me, let me summarize this for you. Love God with everything that is within you and love others like you love yourself. That's it. Do that and you're good. And we love him because he loved us first. That's how John approached false teaching. Amazing. He, he gave us a basic confession of faith. And then he tells us that we're to love God and love each other just as he loved us. Now, remember this. John was not a Westerner. He did not write this letter from New York City. He was an Asian. He had a totally different way of approaching things. He did not think in linear form like we do in the West. A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. He thought in circles. He did spiral thinking. He wasn't the type of cat that would color code his M&Ms, okay? That was not John. And, and what John did, he wrote a gospel that was so radically and totally different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke that we call those first three gospels the synoptic gospels because they mirror each other. But when John wrote his gospel, it was on another planet. It was totally and completely different. John took seven miracles that Jesus did, and he built the entire story of Jesus around these seven miracles to teach the progress of salvation and growth in Christ. And he didn't tell us what he was doing until the very end of his book. That's the way that people do it outside the West, even to this day. <laughs> they will talk in cycles. Bobby, you've seen that living in Africa. And you, you see the way that, that, that people spiral and, and do this. And so, so John, at the very end of his book, told us what he was doing. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he said, Now Jesus did many signs, many wonders in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But he says, these are written. I wrote this stuff so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing you might have life in his name. Do you see what he just did? He said, look, guys, I didn't try to write an encyclopedia or a complete biographical sketch of Jesus. I didn't put this in order. He, he did so many things. I, I suppose not all the books in the world could hold them if I were to write them all. But these things I have written, and here, here's the purpose, so that you that don't believe might believe and have life in his name. It's an evangelistic gospel. Now, many years later, John is writing this first letter, and he's got all this stuff on his heart. How'd you feel? You, you, you've invested your life in seven churches, and now you're beginning to see false teaching creep in. And instead of slashing out, instead of bitterness, instead of, instead of learning how to post on Facebook, he decided that what he would do is he would call people back to what we have in common and to the command to love. And he doesn't tell us what he's doing as is his style, until the very end of the book. Most commentators, most scholars would tell you that chapter 5, verse 13 is the key to 1 John. And here's what John is saying there. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You see what he just did? He wrote his gospel so that you might believe that he's the Son of God and have life. But now, many years later, he's saying, I'm writing this letter because some of you are hurting. You're mixed up. You don't know whether you belong anymore or not. And I'm writing this to you so that you may know that you belong. 25 years ago, we gathered together at Esper Hall. This church was born. For some of you, I had been your pastor for several years. Loved you. I like to think that there was some mutual love and admiration, but 
you, you came here. You came here. We're a part of this. And I'm pretty sure that so many of you did that because you came with a group of friends and people that you felt like you belonged with. And that's why so many of you are still here. Because you have found a place where you can find belonging and understand the power of that. But you know what? There's a lot of people that go to church, and I suppose even this one, who try to blend in. But can I say to you again that blending in is not the same thing as belonging. Belonging. John said, I want to deal with that. And the whole key thought in 1 John is we know that we belong based on the fact of God's acceptance of us, not on our performance, what we do or don't do. And knowing that we have been accepted by God because of what Jesus did, and not what we have done or not done is what enables us to love freely and live confidently. Few things are more powerful in life than to know that we're not alone, to know that we belong. Know, and when John chooses this Greek word that we often translate as know, it means so much more than know does in English. It, it implies not just knowing, but totally understanding, comprehending down to the very basic part of your bones. Not just, yeah, I, I think I understand that. No, no, no. It's, it's not an intellectual understanding. John says, I want you to know that you belong. To know. And there's a way that you can do that. So we start in the middle, all right? Let, let's, let's work out from the middle to the rest of what John says. Let me, let me give you three reasons that you can know how you belong or know that you belong. Go back to verse 1. Here's reason number one. You can know that you belong because you have been born into God's family. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever's been born of Him. Born again. John talked about it. He gave us that famous John 3.16 phrase, right, that we see in every NFL game for the last uh, few decades. <laughs> Which, which is great, but I, I want us to understand that because of that, born again has lost a lot of the punch, kind of like love. Now, what does that really mean? But I want to assure you that to be born of God is not a movement in a certain sector of Christianity. It is Christianity to be born of God. Okay, here's where I struggle again. My dad was very proud of his Scottish ancestry. My dad was the grandson of Scottish immigrants. To be Italian, for the most part, pretty good bet that you're going to be Catholic, right? Be Scottish, pretty good bet you're going to be Presbyterian. <laughs> Just kind of the way that it works. So I grew up in a Presbyterian church. Uh, and, and our Presbyterian, and there, there's, there's good Presbyterian churches and kind of good Presbyterian churches and bad Presbyterian churches, kind of like there's good Baptist churches, bad Baptist churches, and kind of good or kind of bad Baptist churches, right? So in my Presbyterian church, we didn't do the born again thing. Now I learned some Bible. Wonderful people, great church. The older I got, and boy, once I came to understand what faith was all about, my old Presbyterian church was better than it ever had. <laughs> but we didn't do the born again thing. So here is my experience, okay? I was talked into going to see a film by the Billy Graham Association. They sent me a book by Billy Graham called Peace with God. I started reading that in a college dorm room some months later. Nobody was there. I, I, I didn't have a church to go to to raise my hand, come forward in the invitation. Nobody was there to lead me to Jesus. I, I just read that book and started reading my Bible. And, and over the process of time, a couple of weeks, I, I had put my faith in Jesus. 
Now, I couldn't tell you the time, I couldn't even tell you the day, because here's what was happening. This was not an event that happened to me. It was a process that led to a conclusion, that led to a commitment, that led to life because I was born again. So I started going to this Baptist church, and then I really didn't feel like I belonged. A Presbyterian dude in a Baptist church, and, and they're talking about this born-again thing and giving invitations and, and, and all of this that I, I didn't know, and I, 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 I didn't know what to do. Some months later, we had a missionary come through, and I, I was assigned the task to take him back to his hotel. And in the car on the way, I was kind of confessing to him, you know, like it seems like every couple of weeks I'm asking God to save me again because I just want to make sure. And nobody was with me when I came to faith, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't know to write it down. I didn't know to remember the time or all this. And he said, look, son, let me tell you something. He says, can I be honest with you? I don't remember much about when I was born either, only what my mom told me. I was there, but I really don't remember anything at all. But she, she assured me that, that it was okay. And, and here's the deal. I, I don't know about when I was born, but I know that I was born. That liberated me so much. I understood that I had been born again. Now, how do I know that? Let me tell you how I got to the Billy Graham film. I was a disc jockey radio announcer back when I was going through college. We had a lady Pentecostal evangelist. They had a radio program every Saturday morning called the Scriptural Sunshine Hour. It was the hokiest, cheesiest thing that you could possibly imagine. She took it on as her mission in life to convert me. She would give me chick tracks. You know, the little comic book things? I thought she was mentally ill. Seriously. I thought, this lady is passing out this stuff? She, I, I, I mean, I, I believe in God and all this, but this is just, this is insane. And, and she would try to involve me in this and involve me in that. I finally went to the movie just to get her to shut up. Now, listen. Listen to what it says. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever's been born of Him. When I finally understood that I had life in Jesus Christ, you know the first thing I wanted to do? I drove to the farmhouse that that Pentecostal female evangelist lived in, and I wanted to tell her that I had come to faith. And she became my spiritual mom, and I loved her. She was as cheesy and goofy as she was before. But suddenly, I loved her. I don't have any doubt about what Jesus did to me. And I didn't just love her a little bit. Have you noticed in the Bible, you don't love people on a scale of 1 to 10? Now, 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 Bernie, I, I love you about a seven, and, and Bobby, you're only a, a, about a three on my scale. No, no. <laughs> There's only two choices, love or hate. There's only two choices, love or hate. That's it. That's, that's, that's all there is. That's it. That's, that's, that's all there is. And suddenly, I love this woman that I had hated before. I love this woman that I had hated before. Don't tell me that I don't have life. <laughs> Don't tell me that I don't belong to Jesus Christ. Wow. Second reason. Because we're accepted by God and not by our performance. Now, this is a very hard passage I'm going to read to you in verses 2 to 5. Very hard for the Western mind to understand because we get tripped up on our theology rather than trying to listen to what John is saying. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. Now here's the key, here's the key, you're saying, well, well now wait a minute, yeah, you just got to do what is right. No, 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 listen, to here's the key. And His commandments are not burdensome. 
For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, here's the consistent theme in John, his gospel, his epistles. He loved us first. We don't earn it. We don't lose it. He accepted us on the basis of what Jesus Christ did to a love relationship. And love is not a feeling. It is a commitment. You love or you don't. And when you love, it can produce a lot of feelings, good and bad. <laughs> but it's not a feeling. It's a commitment. And what John is saying, if you really belong, you can know that you belong because you don't try to do things to please God, to gain his favor, to get his attention. You do it because it is a joy. It is not a burden. It is a joy to follow him. And when that happens, you know that you belong. Trying to blend in by doing is not the same thing as knowing that you belong. And there's a third reason you can know. It's because Jesus is the Son of God. Not biological Son of God, as some of our Muslim friends might say. No, that's not what John is saying. But rather, he is the very essence of God. And the next passage, again, is a little difficult for the Western mind. Hang with me. What, here's, here's the bottom line. John is not writing this letter to theologians or Bible college students. He's writing this letter to people like you and me that, that have the same type of problems that I've been talking to you about this morning. And John is simply listing the historical events that establish Jesus as God in human form. Now remember, this is how he started the letter. Remember John Stile. He, he, he puts everything between bookends. He started by saying, let me tell you about Jesus. I, I want you to have communion, fellowship with him like I do. I was there. I heard his voice. I felt him. He touched me. I know him. I'm the dude who was there. Not writing to you as a theologian. I was there. And now he comes back to that. And this is what he talks about in this passage in verse 6. This is the one. This is he who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by the water and the blood. Now listen, here's what John is saying. He's not writing this to tickle your theological mind. He's simply saying, I was there when John baptized him in the water. I was there when his blood was shed on the cross. I was there from A to Z. I was with him from beginning to end. He was one of the founding members. His name was on the corporation papers of the Church of Jesus Christ from the beginning. He said, this is me talking. I know what I'm talking about. I was there, folks. And the Spirit is the one who testifies. The Spirit that came down in the form of a dove. Remember that? John started his gospel with that. For there are three that testify. Now here the King James says, three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, now I'm going to put a parenthesis in here. That was a big flashpoint about 120-some years ago. Not as much anymore. Okay? Now, whatever you believe about 1 John 5, 7, can I ask you just to set that aside for a second? I'm not here to argue one way or the other. I'm here to say, understand the number one rule of Bible study, which is context. Understand what John is trying to get across. He's not trying to give us the doctrine of the Trinity, which is established all the way through Scripture. He's simply saying, I'm the dude who was there. This is the testimony. And then he says, the Spirit, the water, the blood. I saw what John saw, the Spirit of God coming down from heaven. I saw him take Jesus and baptize him in the Jordan River. I was there when the blood flowed from his body on the cross. This is me talking. I'm the dude who was there. I'm an old man, but you've got to understand, I'm the last one left of those who were there. You've got to hear me. 
If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God is testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whosoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. He's just just simply saying, folks, in first century language, this is a fact. It's not a feeling. It's not dependent upon the latest commentary or, or Christian book that you read. It's not dependent upon the latest podcast that you listen to. It's not dependent upon the last sermon that you listen to. This is a fact. I was there. The Spirit, the water, the blood. Let me talk to you about it. I'll never forget it. And you should not forget it either. This is the truth, John says. Because of what Jesus Christ did, we belong. Not because of what we do, not because of how hard we work, not because of how much or little we obey, but because we belong to him because he is who he said he was. I was there. So, so, excuse me, I'm okay. I got so excited, my watch said, have you fallen? <laughs> I did not fall. Told you it's been a long time since I've spoken in English. I'm sorry. So, I'm studying this. Pastor Tim's asked me to take this passage and talk about it in a couple of weeks, and it was, it was actually one week before I was supposed to speak on this. I'm sorry, before I was supposed to speak on this morning, and um, we're, we always sat, my wife and I always sat directly behind Pastor Tim. <laughs> It, 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 it's both a, a way to give him a hug before he gets up and symbolically to say, this is my man right here. <laughs> And so we're sitting right there behind him, and he's up speaking, doing the normal great job that he does. And all of a sudden, I felt my watch vibrate again. And all of a sudden, I felt my watch vibrate again. I was speechless. I'm looking at my watch, and on my watch is a picture of the house that I grew up in. I'm speechless. I'm confused. I'm disoriented. Like, where did this come from? Where did this come from? Service is over. I, 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 I run to the side. I'm, I've got my phone out. I'm like, okay, what's going on? One of the few people in my high school class that I've ever seen again who knew where I was had sent me, he forwarded me this picture of my house that had appeared in a closed Facebook group of people who had gone to high school where I went. He said, this is your house. He said, this is your house. What? I, 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 I got home, I opened up my computer, I'm trying to get on Facebook and figure out what this is all about. It's a closed group. I had to ask permission. Do you know anybody in this group? Yes, I know people in this group. Yes, please, let me in, let me in, let me in. And, and I found out that the senior planner of the little city that I'd grown up in, a little town of about 12,000 people, had just bought the house that I grew up in. And he was trying to find out his history. He said, I love history. I really want to know about this house. And by the time I got home, there were between 80 and 90 comments, not likes, comments from people that I went to school with. Well, this is Jeff Adams' house. Well, this is, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm like, ha, 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 ha. And all of a sudden, inside me, something was beginning to happen. And, and I jumped on, and, and I said, you know, yeah, the, most of these comments are right spot on. And I had a picture of the house as it had looked when it was built by my Scottish immigrant great-grandparents back in the 1880s. And I said, yes. Uh, somebody had said, well, I think that, you know, somebody, you know, sold it. I said, no, no, no. The, this house was in our family from the late 1880s. This, this room here, it was my room. 
It is also the room where my father was born in 1925, and it's the room where my grandmother was born in 1898. But all these people were jumping in and saying, well, I remember I did Jeff and blah, blah, blah. This is so stupid. I thought back and I realized when I was in high school, I was the quiet, lonely kid that didn't have a lot of friends, but yet I was elected president of the junior class. The next year, my senior year, I was put up to run for student council president. It wasn't my desire. I was nominated. I was running against the two most popular athletes in the school. I was elected student council president. And I thought to myself, that doesn't sound like somebody who doesn't belong. And you know what I realized at that time? I realized a great biblical truth. I was fighting against feelings, not against facts. And I realized that it was time for me to doubt my doubts and faith check my facts. I, I can't tell you, I'm, I'm still not sure how I work all of that out emotionally. But I came to realize that popularity and hanging out is not the same thing as belonging either. And for the first time since I put that city in the rear view mirror on my way off to college, I felt like I belonged. And then I felt like a fool because I'd wasted 50 years of potential friendships with people I had gone to school with that I had never reached out to and contacted. The lies that we tell ourselves. When you know that you belong, ladies and gentlemen, number one, it gives you confidence in prayer, verse 14. This is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the request that we've asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. Whoa, wait a minute, what's that? What's that? Forget it, forget it, forget it. Put it aside. That's not the point. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for it. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to, to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Now, John says this, when you know that you belong, you know what to pray for because you pray according to God's will. You can pray with confidence. And you are also praying for others, loving, relational prayers, not just asking for God to heal me of COVID, although that's important as well, but loving, relational prayers, not, not judging, but praying. And then he says that this whole thing, there is a sin that leads to death, but that's not the point to speak of some mysterious, horrible thing that maybe I committed, but I'm not sure I'll have to go talk to the pastor about. If you read the content, text of the book in chapter 4. He's just talked about some false teachers that are coming in. And what John is saying in his first century language quaint way, he's saying, look guys, don't worry about the people that are teaching the wrong things. Love them. Be there for them when they need help. Don't worry about it. Just know that you belong and pray with confidence. Now, let them take care of their own relationship with God. You don't have to name names and take license plates. You don't have to fight them. Just love them. And secondly, it gives us confidence in our relationship with God. Verse 19 says, we know that we're from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We know that the Son of God has come, given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. We are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. Excuse me, and his son Jesus Christ, he's the true God, eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. What? Where did that come from? <laughs> kind of like John has maybe got some early onset dementia, and these thoughts are just kind of randomly popping into his mind. I don't, th I don't think so at all. In, in fact, what is an idol? Whatever comes between you and God. 
And, and idols are not just wood and stone and, and, and metal, wood, but they can also be those pet little quirky ideas that divide believers and become full-blown heresies that John has been talking about since chapter 4. That's still what divides churches today. When people forget what we have in common, when people forget what we have in common. And they start focusing on their little quirky ideas. And, on their little quirky and insist ideas. that everybody else agree with them on every single point. That becomes an idol. And that becomes destructive. And John said, stop it. Stop it. Just stop it. Three, it gives you confidence to connect well with others who also belong. What do we have in common? We have a faith. We have a mission. So we focus there. Here's the fact. God has already accepted me. I don't have to do anything else to be accepted by God. And you know what? I would love for you to accept me, but I don't need that. Because I've already got that from God. Thank you very much. So you can try to make me feel like I don't belong. That's fine. I'm not going to worry about that because I, I because I know where I belong where it's most important. John's message, if somebody else doesn't live this out, that's John's their problem. Message, it's not yours, though you must love them, bless them, be there if and when they ask for help. You do belong and do not let your feelings stand in the way of the facts. Love is a commitment. It's not a feeling. Two buckets only, love or hate. Or what does that say about the state of Christianity in our society today. Well, he doesn't believe in the in the in, in pre-tribulation rapture, so I, I hate him. In pre-tribulation rapture, so I hate him. Really. Really. What does that say about the state of what we have in our heart? About the state of what we have in our heart. Fighting feeling. Some of you say, well, it seems like God's so distant. Wait a minute, what do the facts say? <laughs> God distant? Wait, 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 I'm sorry. Where, where is he? Is, do you know him? Do you belong? Then he is in you. And you are in him. You may feel like you're distant, and that, that's a legitimate feeling. Find out what it's pointing to and deal with it. Do you understand that most of the things that we wrestle with are lies that we believe about ourselves? Just like that. Doubts to doubt, fears to fact check. Do you love God? Are you connected to Him? And if not, get connected today. Receive His love. Blending in is not belonging. Find the facts and belong. I'm not asking you to belong to First Bible Baptist Church of Blue Springs. I think it's a great church. I love this church. I love what you've done. I love the fact that 25 years later, here you are staying by the stuff. Thank you, God. I'm not asking you to join First Bible Baptist Church. I'm asking you to join Jesus' family. And wherever you decide to go to church, that's fine. That's between you and God. Churches are different, just like families. There are a lot of families that I would like to be a part of, a lot of families that I would not like to be a part of. Churches are like that too. But there's one for you. But here's the thing. There's a fact that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again, and because of that, there's nothing left for you to do except surrender to him and let him control your life. And because of that, it's not a burden to follow him. Well, I have to do this, I have to do that. No, that, that that's not even the issue here. The issue is who is Jesus. And once you figure that out, it's all smooth ahead of you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray here in just a second. And uh, Maddie's going to come back and, and sing for us. And as she's singing, if you have a need to know that you belong. Or if you have a need of any kind, Pastor Mark's here, Pastor Bobby's here, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be here. Come and let us help you. Let's, let's all stand together as we, as we pray. Father, I'm just so grateful to you, so thrilled to see the blessings 
that you have given to this church over the years to reconnect with faithful people who have loved you and served you for all the 25 years of, of this church and more. God, thank you for the leaders in this church. Thank you for Pastor Dwayne and the way that he has just uh, led us into the presence of God today and all the musicians who've worked with him. God, thank you for a time of celebration. Thank you, Lord, that we can know that we belong and to know the power of that. And God, anyone here who is caught in the trap of a powerful lie that has stagnated them and derailed them and is holding them back from the life that you have for them, Lord, may they lay that lie aside this morning and simply surrender to you and to focus on the things that hold us together, your love, that you loved us first, and that now we love you and we love others as ourselves, not just other members of our church, but Jesus who taught us to love our enemies, not on a scale of one to ten, but to love them. Lord, do your work in our lives in Jesus' name.